It's Blaine Salvador Kern. But in New Orleans here, I'm better known as Mr. Mardi Gras nowadays. <laughs> And um, were you born in New Orleans? Born in Algiers, please. Okay. That's, that's a suburb of New Orleans, yes, very much so. Okay. Um, growing up, how did, how was it growing up during the Great Depression? Oh, boy. People, we'd take, after we ate at night, we'd take a certain part of the garbage can where it was clean and, and paper and all, and we, whatever food we didn't eat, we'd put, and it were families would walk by dozens of families and take the food out of the garden and put it in a can of it that they'd be carrying and bring it home to eat. That went on all over. How it, the difference was, to talk about a difference in mentality, they gave away milk and cheese at the old courthouse in Algiers back in the early 30s, maybe 33, 34, maybe 35, something like that, in the height of the Depression. Now, people were hungry, and only two families went and got the cheese and milk free. And everybody else in Algi has talked about him, says, where was their dignity? How could they do that? Can you believe this? This is true, what I'm saying. You don't make something like that up. Anyway, but uh, my dad was an artist, but he couldn't make a living as an artist. He painted signs. And it was going to be Roy Kern and Son signs. And I was, but I'm very gifted as, I'm talented. <clears throat> I never lost an art contest as a boy coming up in, that's all I ever did. I was always in trouble drawing pictures in school and reading books. And, um, but I was raised not even in the 20th century. I was raised in the 19th century. I'll tell you how that was. Most people don't know prior to 1940, not, most of the teachers in all the United States and most of the nurses in all the United States couldn't marry and be a nurse or a teacher. That, you talk about lack of civil rights, but this is true. And there, you heard the expression, old maid school teachers? That's where it comes from. And my mother, believe it or not, was raised by four of these old ladies. Old lady, and we went and lived with them because we didn't have the $17.50 a month for the rent. And so we lived with these old ladies, and it was incredible. The, the, the lifestyle was, uh, they were in their 80s back in their 19, early 30s, when I was five, six years old. And they told me of Spoon's butler, the beast butler, who captured New Orleans, and they put a picture of him. He's a general, a Yankee general, they said. And he, they put a picture of, of his face on a chamber pot. And, and it's just true. And they told me about my great uncle Ross, who wasn't my uncle Ross at all, but he was a prisoner of war down at the foundry field, and they brought him food. And they told me about the occupation. And they were school teachers before Reconstruction, and believe it or not, they... Uh, taught Chinese, black, and white all together. Then Jim Crow came along the laws and absolutely, you know, and then it, it didn't happen anymore. But these old ladies had a library in their homes. And I read H.G. Wells and Sir Arthur Cohen Dahl and Jules Verne and Edgar Rice Burroughs. And I was going to the moon before Sputnik. To this day, I read every night of my life. But it's given me a vivid imagination like very few people I know. And it's, it's carried me now throughout the world, really, this I imagination with building my business. And what I do, I'm the biggest in the world now, believe it or not. My company is called Kern Studios, a Blaine Kern artist, and I'm in about 60 cities worldwide. I've, I've got parades going on in China, Japan, and Korea. I'm talking about with the biggest companies over there and the biggest theme parks for the next four and five years. I got 300 people working in China making the beads and trinkets that thrown from the floats. Me and Dan Kelly with beads about a dozen and Kern International. And then I've got parades that we do and work we do in Spain, in France, in Italy, in Germany. And I'm all over the, the, the world because I'm in Las Vegas. I do all the casinos, the big giant icons in Atlantic City. And uh, what else? Oh, my goodness. Oh, and uh, oh, I'm very good at what I do. A man named Darwin Fenner, whose grandpa had a cotton plantation here. Darwin Fenner, his daddy was Charlie Fenner. And at that daddy started a company called Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Bean, the biggest stock brokerage firm in the world. And Darwin Fenner was the captain of Rex. Rex, of course, is Latin for king, and it's the highest monarch here, the king of, the, of Mardi Gras. Darwin Fenner took me when I was a boy, after I'd been doing some parades, for Dr. Henry the Rocker, I did the crew of, well, I'll go back. In 19, 
1932 and 1931, when I was only four or five years old, Daddy took one float and 40 guys marched behind the one float from the Algiers Ferry to the Gretna Ferry. And, for, and that was the beginning of the crew of Allah, A-L for Algiers and L-A for Louisiana, Allah. Daddy couldn't make a, lo a living doing the floats. <clears throat> So he's painted signs, and like I said, it was going to be, and I was helping him when I was 10 and 11 years old. I was working already. Of course, I was going to school, but I was working. And I worked on trawl boats. I worked on tugboats. I did all kind of jobs. But boy, and then I remember being about 13 or 14 years old when Pearl Harbor hit. And I remember living on Slidell Street, and I heard the Japs bombing and all that. And boy, I ran out the whole day. It was electrifying when it happened, you know? And I can remember that, and I said, God, I want to go fight these guys at yeah, 13 or 14, you know. And I was too young. And then I had mastoiditis before penicillin, not before penicillin had been invented, but they weren't using it. And I was anointed. Uh, I died literally two or three times, and I was a sickly child from the time I was about four to 11 or 12. I was told never to wrestle and swim, all kind of stuff. But nowadays with penicillin, it's not a but it was a serious thing. That meant my face swelled up and closed my eyes and I couldn't walk. I was in a hospital for months at a time. Anyway, the whole point was I was a sickly kid, but then I started getting strong and playing football and, and the team and at, the, at the high school, went to Berman High School, that these old ladies taught there, believe it or not. I dedicated the cornerstone and I, I planted saplings this big around, magnolia tree saplings, and the magnolia trees are this big today because Alice Hart, who they named the school after her, had been raised by those old ladies I told you about. They uh, had raised, and Alice Hart, the school teacher. So that's why I was picked to be the, the uh, and to do the uh, cornerstone and all that stuff. But anyway, I painted signs, I worked on trawl boats, tug boats, and everything. And I was a good piece of man when I was 16 or 17. And I tried, and I took a test. And I was going to be in, in, it was the Army Air Corps in those days. Man, I wanted to be a pilot, by all means. But then I went and I had this punctured, a perforated eardrum from the operation. So I couldn't make it. And boy, I tried to get the Marines, everything. Nobody would take me. But then when I got made 18, a few days later, I was on my way up there by 18. The, the infantry naturally took me. <clears throat> well, I went up from, up to, up, uh, to uh, Camp Chaffee in Arkansas. And then from Camp Chaffee, that's in western Arkansas, I went across to um, Port, uh, I mean, Camp Robinson at, in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, Camp Robinson, J.T. Robinson. <clears throat> and when I was there, I went up with a couple of guys. One was a guy named Bernie Dukerson, Bernard Dukerson. And I was with a couple other fellows. And this is the time when the jitterbugging was a big craze and zoot suits and all that kind of nonsense. But anyway, I was friends with these guys at camp. And then, in, but it, what, when, man, I went into camp and peeling potatoes and all that kind of stuff. And I've always been pretty s smart and pretty th a good thinker and about not having to do this kind of work. And I said, hey, I'm an artist. What do you all need? So I started painting murals in, in, in the mess halls <clears throat> and signs. And then it was, a, I remember there was a, little, a Jewish captain named Goldberg. And he wanted to keep me stateside. And we, I, I was, this was in basic training, you know? And man, uh, uh, I wanted to go over, I wanted to go kill Japs, the hell with. So I could have stayed stateside. I said, no man, let's go. So I came home and I'm shipping out. And I go up to, um, um, where did I go? Oh, uh, Seattle, Washington. And we're getting on a ship. And don't you know what happened? The war ended. Man, I was angry, I really was. I know it sounds nuts to say things like this, but I've seen pictures of the Japanese taking and ripping open the belly of a woman's pregnant, pulling out the baby, putting it on a bed, and wrapping the entrails around their body. And they were like animals. And when I got over there towards Base M, the ship diverted and took me up to Korea. And, and uh, but, but then some of the guys who'd been prisoners were brought to a, a war in Corregidor. God almighty. You know, I got to meet these guys, and they told me this horrible tales what the Japanese had done to them, atrocities that you can't believe had done. And then, further than that, when I got home, I know I'm skipping around here, but I had a little guy, we called him Chink, and Chink was, uh, died prematurely. I don't know, Chink, Chink was 45 years old, and he looked like he was 70, but he had been a prisoner 
in over there, and or he was on a Batan death march, and he told me about him taking uh, uh, like a large nut off of a, like a big piece of equipment and put string around his scrotum and hang the nut on the scrotum like this. Then it give him two buckets of water to hold. Then he would take another bucket and put it on his head. Then it walk by and it hit the bucket on his head with the, and this is hurting him all the time. And he's standing like this. And then when they hit the bucket, if he spilled any water, they beat the shit up. Of they pulled his fingernails out. And, and, but, but all of this. So, but anyway, I go into Korea. And then I went into, it was called Incheon. And I remember going in there and it was winter. And my God, it was so interesting to me. All of a sudden, I, I researched everything because I, I was an avid reader. I read more books than anybody in Algiers in those days. I really did. And I do the land of the morning calm, and I went over, and but then it was freezing cold. And golly, and then we saw, we saw the people, but then the people were taking little children, one and two, three-year-old children, and there was ice and snow. And they were throwing the children out into the snow, ice and snow. We were getting on a train, on a troop train, going to take us to our camp. So what do we do? We got ice in our jackets on a big ja big coats. We take it off our coats and give them to the children. That was the whole idea, to get our clothes, warm clothes. And I took my jacket off and everything, and I gave it to one of the little boys that was freezing. And I could, but I can remember that. And then we got on the train, and we went up, and we went to Kwanju, and then we went into a place out of out of Seoul, uh, it was further south into a town called Yosu. That was just in a in in the paper two days ago. There was a monster oil spill off the Korean coast. Remember that? And they were in Yosu was going to have a deal on the environment because this was a beautiful area that I ended up living in. I lived in a Japanese air base. On it was in Quonset Huts, and it was at this air and it was a school there, and there was a air base for seaplanes that went out into the ocean there. And there was these junks, and oh my God. We, we, I remember going into this place and meeting, we called them gooks, it's not very complimentary, and God, I'm not a racist. In fact, I've been a civil rights activist my whole life. But that was an expression, gooky, didn't mean it in an ugly way, but we were ignorant, and that's the expressions we use that way. But anyway, the point is, is that we would eat at, at the mess halls, and then we couldn't even give the food that we had left over to the people, otherwise it'd be a riot. So they would take the food down to the riverfront, or the harbor rather, which was only, a, a, I guess, a, a block or two, or three blocks, and they would dump it overboard. But, and it was water, it was only a two or three foot, two, and the people would be laying, standing there in the water, even in cold weather, and would be grabbing the food with baskets and everything out of the water. And I thought it was so stupid. Why? Did, uh, anyway, but the point was, these people were literally starving to death, and we were, uh, so. Getting to that, I remember scraping rocks, in other words, uh, in the ocean, and there was a green like a fuzz or a, a, a growth, and they would scrape and they'd make soup out of this. I remember this, but I also remember, you know, <clears throat> it was oh, it was it was pretty tough, and the people there, the the, the Korean people, hated the Japanese. They hated them, and they they were the Imperial Marines. They were a little bit bigger physically than the Japanese. And, but boy, there was no love lost, I'll tell you that. And I would hear the stories of them and all. But anyway, I lived there for over a year. And, and I got to know the people. I spoke a little bit of the language. I could still, Anya, Simnika, Idiwai, Diosho. I can remember some of the words and some of the things we said, you know. And every once in a while, I'll go back because I do a big, big parade now in Seoul at the, uh, oh God, what the heck's the name of the, uh, the theme park there? It's a, done by. Who makes the big automobiles in Korea? Um, oh, I forget the name of the auto. No, not Hyundai. 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 The guy that owns that has a theme park, and I and I do a parade there for him, and, and it's a smash parade, a big hit, and they love it. And I'd go. I've gone back a few times to see it, you know. And and they go. And Korea, my God, it has changed. Today you go there, and there's. Uh, you see 50 apartments, 30, have you been ever? Well, anyway, 50 or 60, 30 story buildings, number one, two, three, four, five. They live like almost like ants in an anthill. I don't like it as much. It used to be more beautiful. But I remember being over there in Korea 
and we had a mountain in the back of us and hills. And boy, I was always been an avid fisherman and a hunter, not a really a hunter, but an avid fisherman. But we got over there and there was no milk we ever saw, no salad or lettuce. We just didn't have anything. Oh, what interesting thing. When I was coming into Korea, when we were 30 miles out at sea, you could smell it. You know what you smelled? No, no excretion. Crap. Because we called them the honey cart men. They, 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 they cultivated and they put the excretion on the plants to make them grow. So I swear to God, you could smell it 20 or 30 miles out at sea, you smelled crap. This is true, horrible to say, but true. But then you live there a while and you, the, the smell went away because you become accustomed to it. But anyway, we had that, but we never had milk and water. And then, man, we had shit on a shingle, we called it. You've heard that expression before, right? Well, the old, old vets use that. And man, the food was pretty bad, but man, I ate everything, God. And I was in incredible shape. I was 18, 19 years old. And I was strong as a bull. I was a linebacker on the football team. I went from being a little shrimp up to about 160, 165 pounds, hard as a rock. Anyway, and I started, with, I, I could do things on parallel bars and flipping. And I was being taught by the Koreans who were really good at that themselves. And I was boxing. They didn't know anything about boxing. But I would box one or two kids every day would come in and everything. And I never lost a fight. I was going to be a professional fighter. This is true. This was stupid. But this is a, that's what Blaine Kerner. I also wanted to be an altar boy, but I was a little bitty boy. True story. Not an altar boy, a priest, a priest. Anyway, the thing is, I'm over there, and I'm working out with these kids in good shape, and I'm painting signs, and I'm painting uh, uh, murals, and, and, and then so there's no rank for an artist in the Army, so I become a machine gun. Sergeant, and they give me a, 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 I think I was a C3, a, I forget what the hell it was. I had three stripes, whatever that is, and a technical sergeant. I even forgot to rank I was now. But anyway, uh, was really interesting. Uh, but let me tell you what I did when I was there. The, the, the colonels, the, the majors, they all liked, now, oh, I was the world's worst soldier. Oh, I hated the salute. Oh, oh I was horrible. I've never been able to take orders in my life. No, I haven't. I, I run my. I, I give other people orders now, but I'll tell you what. I've been in business sixty years. This year, I've never fired one person in all the years I've been in business, and I'm, and people have been with me forever. The girl sits across me. has been with me forty five years. Anyway, and people stay. But anyway, that's getting off the point. The thing was when I was over there, I I, I painted a, a eagle on a colonel's steel helmet or his helmet on the liner, you know. And then I did one for the major. Well, everybody else wanted it. Well, I start charging everybody else. Then, and then I start making money, a dollar, two dollars. That wasn't much. But then I started, I'm a good promoter. I started washing, and I had these, I call them gooks, who'd wash the clothes for me, and polishing belt buckles and shining shoes. And so I was making more money than the regimental colonel was, and I was a private. And I was making that kind of, I swear, I really, I'm a, I'm a tremendous promoter. And I was doing all this. And then, but I remember doing this and sending the money back to my mother. Oh, I wrote a letter every day of my life to my mother. And I numbered it. And she wrote a letter to me and numbered it. And that was going back and forth. And I drew pictures of the Korean people. I, got, I don't even know where these letters are. I've got to find them. They just would misplace something about five years ago. But I, I, I would put drawings, and I'd said, to, and, and, and come in attractions. I'd, I'd draw like a little billboard. And I'd say, it's come, something coming soon. And then something. And then I would explain something in a letter. It made it interesting. But then I, I would draw the junks, the ocean, the mountains. And then talking about the food a little bit ago, I heard there was an antelope up in the mountains that was delicious. And I'd never hunted. I'd been a fisherman my whole life, working on trawl boats and everything with daddy. But I'm sort of chicken hearted. Even when I catch a fish and I hear it flopping around the box, I feel, but anyway, I fish. I got two fishing camps out to the mouth of the river yet. And my, my, my business is crowds today. I threw the biggest parties in the United States. I threw thick thousands and thousands here in the Superdome. I rolled the, but anyway, that's another story. But the point is, 
is I go up and I'm going to kill one of these antelope. Now, these antelopes are not like you've ever seen. They're not that very big, but they have a tusk, and the tusk comes down like this. And I don't even know the name of it, and I've always wanted to look up what I was hunting. But anyway, I go up there, and I start up the side of the mountain. And now I'm only 18, maybe I'm 19. And I'm up in there, and I look, and finally I see an antelope, one way ahead. And I go running after him, and he goes scrambling up the rocks. And I keep going after him. And I was in good shape. I followed that thing up to near the top of that mountain. It was a pretty high mountain. I mean, the, the whole base looked about this big in that bottom. And I was traveling, I mean, for hours going after that animal. And he was moving, and there was a place like where he, he, it was, a, I forget what you'd call it, but a part of the mountain that caved in. And he went into there, and I knew I had him sort of trapped in there. I said, oh, boy. I said, I'm going to get this, because I couldn't get a shot before. Well, finally, I go up in there, and he cannot go any further, and he's not 100 yards from me. Not even that far. My God, no. I'm saying 50 yards. I'll tell you why I know how close he was. I could see his eyes. Man, I put the rifle stock, and I wasn't traveling with a GI. I had an old ri rifle that was a Japanese rifle, and I was using that. But we'd practice with that. We, I knew how to use it. And I put that rifle stock up, and I looked at that beautiful animal, and he was, his chest was going heaving like this, and I looked in his eyes. I didn't get buck fever, but he was so beautiful, and I'm an artist. I couldn't kill that thing more than fly to the moon. And I looked at him, and then I put the rifle down his chest. I put it down, he went, he didn't go 20 feet from me, speeding down the rock. And I'm looking at it, and I said, all this for nothing, but what the hell? But I'll always remember looking into the eyes of that that animal, that antelope, and, and it stayed with me the rest of my life. I've never hunted ever, ever since, and I've been in the African zone, jungle. I've been in, uh, capturing animals in the Amazon. I've done more things than most people ever dream about in, in my life. That's probably, you don't want to hear about all that. But seriously, uh, I remember that. I came back without any meat or anything like that. But I was painting signs at the same time. And I painted a huge sign down in Inchon over the, over the road. It said, the best damn port in the Pacific, Inchon. And I remember that. And it went over. It was huge, big, big things. And, there, and everybody who came on that road had to go under that sign. Now, this was in 1945 I painted that. In 1950 or 51, the Korean War started, remember? Yeah. And they were showing pictures of Korea. What do you think? There's the sign, the best airport. I said, hey, man, I did that. I'm still a boy. What the hell? I was only uh, in, in, my God, I was 19, I was probably 20. I was 26, 27 years old. Well, I hated the service. I hated it. God, I, I, I loved the concept and all, but I didn't like saluting people and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> My daddy, Roy Kern, was a sign painter, was an artist. Well, when I came in from basic training, he had a captain and a colonel at the airport, I'm not airport, but rather at the train station to carry my luggage from me. They, they were buddies of his, you follow? And, and really, my daddy was a promoter, believe me, he really was too. But I can remember that. But man, but I probably was the world's worst soldier. I was so bad that I couldn't even pass an inspection. Now, I, guys would make the beds and all that for me, and I, but the, there was a major Reynolds, and he, he was married, he had his children there. And he would tell me, Blaine, get lost. And I would take the kids and go up in the hills, because I couldn't pass it. I just, I couldn't see myself doing all that. I, I really was bad. I want to emphasize that. Also, I was a soldier, supposed to be a machine gun. So, okay. I knew precious little about that damn machine gun, I want you to know. But they gave me this rank. So there was, a, wait, the communists were going to have an uprising. We had some prisoners in a compound in downtown Yosu. And, boy, we were alerted because the commies were already giving us trouble at that point in time, you know, and even in southern Korea. And then I remember we were saying, well, you guys have got to stand here and guard that these people don't come, in other words, and try to get these prisoners out of, the, uh, out of this compound. Well, here they come, it's one night, and I'm standing, and I got two machine guns on and trailers, and I'm supposed to be in charge of them. <laughs> Thank God they knew how to handle the machine guns. And then the people are coming, you all see like in the movies, 
thousands of people moving with torches and all of them. And they come in, and I said, oh, my God, we can't, can't fire on these people. Jesus, God Almighty. They came, and they literally, hundreds of them, literally picked up the whole side of the building, picked it up. Just it wasn't a big building to start with. And they left, and left the people out from <laughs> Just picked it up off his foundation. And we just watched him do it. We didn't do anything about it. What the hell? We couldn't even. We wouldn't have wanted you. We'd have killed punches. We'd probably have been killed ourselves, but we'd have killed so many. it had been a slaughter. But I do remember that, and I remember thinking to myself, my God Almighty, afterwards, when the, when the, the Chinese came over in Yalu at the 80, was it the 37, 87 parallel? 37. Huh? 37. 37th parallel. I remember that. And I'm saying, boy, drop a goddamn bomb on them now. You know why? I went to China on a, a, a one trip into China from Yosu. It was very not that far. And I saw drugs use over there. And I said, oh, boy, am I glad I'll never see that in the United States, opium dens and all that stuff. But that was ruining that government. That's how the British, the French, the Russians kept them. They called it gunboat diplomacy prior to World War II because I think the British introduced opium in, in, in the time of the Dowage Empress of Baca, the Dowage Empress of Baca Rebellion and all that. And that wonderful country, five, 6,000 years old, came apart within two or three generations because I was there in 45, and so that's only 50 years or 45 years later. And just thinking two generations of 6,000-year-old country was becoming, and, and, a, and a country that respected parenthood and the family and all, and boy, how wrong I was. But when I heard about the drugs starting to come into the United States, I was the biggest advocate say, well, if you find it's in an airplane, shoot the plane out of the sky, and if it's on a ship, sink the damn ship. I said, well, do you find them, have a trial for them, and the next day find them guilty, and bring them to Jackson Square, and put sandbags in Jackson Square, and execute them publicly. And I said, oh, Blaine, you're too radical. Well, but I, I travel all over the world. There's no drugs in Saudi Arabia. There's no drugs in countries in China now. I'll go back there. If there is, they kill, God Almighty. I've seen them. They take in China, because I've, I've, been, I've been going to China. My first trip was in 45, but, and I've been back eight or 10 times, and I've got a factory people working. But when I first started going over there, they would take somebody and bring them outside and take, and shoot them in the back of the head, the hands by, and then they take the bullet and charge the family for the bullet that killed them. I mean, but there was no drugs. Now that's the other end of the spectrum, but that's what we've ruined virtually the black race. And even, you know, people here, it's absolutely, it, would, it, it sounded cruel what I was suggesting, but it would have been a good deal because we never would have had that here now. I'm a little bit maybe too radical yet, yeah, I, don't, I don't know, but anyhow. Yeah. Corrupted the culture. Yeah, it did corrupt the culture. It really and truly did. And did I say too much? I mean, no, okay, fine. You're yeah. Fine. Um, could you tell me more about the Corregidor, uh, the POW story? Oh God, yeah. Well, they would. You know, you saw them on the death march, and the guy that told me most of these stories was Chink. He came to work for me, and his son worked for me too. And he was, oh, God, he'd get full of paint and splashed all over him, and he put on the same clothes the, the next day or something, and shoes. And, but then he told me the how he'd hear people. Every night, people would be crying. Men would be crying and all. And they would whimper and be hurt because they were so cruel to him and, and because they didn't have the same value of life that we did. They really didn't. And you know, these are people in the Orient, my God, in China at that point in time, if there was a baby born, it was a, a girl, they'd put it out in the dung heap and, and let the die child die. They didn't want the girls, they wanted boys that could work the farms and keep take care of them when they got old. But anyway, so the idea of life was completely different. Now they were hard, hard working. The, the, I mean, the, the soldiers were tough. They bragged that they could live and I remember them telling they could live on a cup of rice a day and drink water out of a lagoon, anything, and live and fight. Well, in other words, we proved to be just as tough as they were. Uh, we used to go, I remember in bivouac, in camping, I'd have a 40-pound pack on my back. I remember that. 
And we'd march 20 and 25 miles with that on our back. And then I carried what was called a Boeing automatic rifle. And that was, I mean, the heaviest weapon, but God, it was accurate and fast, but heavy. I think that thing weighed, God, it's so many years, I don't know, 15, 20 pounds? Roughly. Roughly, I'm just, I don't remember. All I know is we were in the back of the platoon, we were the fourth platoon. And you know, every, each, each one of the platoons thought we were better than the others, you know that. And we'd sing out against each other when we were marching and that kind of business. But I was, a, the, the, I was that guy because I was the strongest guy in there too. I was a champion boxer and all that wrestler, everything. But anyway, I remember uh, uh, carrying that thing, that heavy bounding, bounding uh, uh, automatic rifle. I just remember carrying that. Well, I'll tell you what was interesting too. We went overseas, and the ship I was on, I was a cartoonist. Oh, I drew for the Stars and Stripes. I forgot to say that. Very important, yeah. As, as a young man, just going over, I was drawing for the company newspapers, and and and, uh, and I drew a cartoon. I've still got some of the old cartoons I drew from the ship going overseas, you know? And But I remember being on, on you know, wrestling on there, and oh, and I'd been fishing, and I was working on trunk bo tow, tow boats, trawl boats, as a boy. So everybody, I can remember, it was about 2,800 of us on that ship going over. It was a Liberty ship, it was called. A Liberty ship. Incidentally, some of the ships in those days was made of concrete. Did you know that? Yes, sir. And, and, but this wasn't. But anyway, but I remember, oh, no, it wasn't a Liberty, it was a victory. It was, that was right, a victory, it's just starting. So what happened was, I remember being on that ship with all these good-looking young 18, 19-year-old boys, 17, some of them, you know, strong, man, we're going to go over there. Oh, and the book I remember more than anything in basic training, I'm jumping around, but it hits me, was a book. And you know what the title of the book was? You Don't Think. Have you ever heard that before? You don't, oh, I swear to God, they gave me a book that says you don't think. I said, yeah, bullshit. <laughs> this guy thinks. That's what I said. Right off the bat, I was going to be a bad soldier, I'm afraid. But honest to God, you don't think. They just wanted you to charge, you know? I said, uh-huh, yeah, okay. But anyway, the thing is, I remember all those virile young men. And then we hit Puget Sound, and we hit the first ground swells. And all of a sudden, I see these guys getting queasy. And my God Almighty, they started getting seasick. And then the first day, oh, I'd say if there was 2,800 men, 2,700 were sick. You know why they were sick? You had four bunks the chained together. And wait, the guy at the top would puke down. And it stenched in the hole. You couldn't go in and wait. In the toilet, there was the, the whole width of the ship, there was toilets. And the, you'd see one guy sitting on the toilet, hugging the other bull, throwing up here, pooping this way. <laughs> and wait, and the puke would go slushing. And they come, but the ship would go this way, the puke would come back. Jesus Christ, I was up on deck. I slept on the steel deck. I couldn't go down there, but I was only of a handful because I'd been a mariner. You follow working on tugboats and, and trawl boats, fishing, and these other kids didn't have that advantage. But God, I remember the stench of that damn ship. And well, the, the second day they were sick, the third, for three, it was about the third day they were starting to get their sea legs. And they came out, and they looked like they were 20 years old, and they had beards, they hadn't shaved, and they looked like they had died and were coming back to life. But what a difference. But then they got everything, you know, by the end of the ship, uh, the and it went, we went. But I remember going up near Siberia. I remember that. It was uh, near, not Siberia, the Aleutian Islands, rather, in a great arc going over. And it was cold and, and all that kind of business. But... Uh, Oh, interesting, I, I mentioned going in the Army in basic training, and this one guy was Bernard Dukerson, Bernie Dukerson. He was a hell of a good fighter here. And there was another fellow named, you may have heard of, Sugar Ray Robinson, one of the greatest fighters of all time, for his weight, middleweight. And when I came home on leave before being shipped out, these guys, Frank Kemai, and Frank Kemai was famous because he got jitterbug with three girls at one time. <laughs> they
And he had a, I remember, he named himself Frankie K. Frankie was Italian, called himself Frankie K. And this Bernard Dukerson, who was in basic care, now I'm a first fast at all. He'd put a handkerchief on the ground and he'd stand there and he'd invite you to hit his face. And you'd be right next to him and you couldn't hit his face. He was that fast. He was like lightning. I mean, a hell of a fight. That he had had, oh, I don't know, maybe 100. In those days, people had 100, 200 fights. They fought every week. They put their hands down in salt water and brine to toughen it all. Yeah, they don't fight that way anymore because of income taxes. They make so much money and they can't. These fighters today make, you know, they make 30 fights, 35 fights. These had two or 300 fights. Can you believe that? That's all they did. But anyway, what do you think? I'm in the ballroom listening, and it's national radio. That's for television. Bernie Dukerson versus Sugar Ray Robinson. Now, he got out of the Army. I don't know how the hell he got out on a, something. He was 4F, something or the other. And I'm listening to this guy giving Sugar Ray Robinson, one of the greatest boxers of all time, giving him a boxing lesson. It was a 15-rounder until he was the 13th or the 14th round. He decides to slug it out with Sugar Ray, and Sugar Ray got to him and knocked him out. But he was giving Sugar the greatest boxer, maybe in the history, a box. He was incredibly fast. He was Filipino and white in combination. Bernard Dukerson. And it just people, some people, around, people in New Orleans remember the name, older people anyway, with it all. But anyway, I know I'm bounced all around, but I guess you want all that, right? Yes, sir. Just so sure. Um, when you arrived in Korea, were there still some Japanese POWs? Oh, no, but I'll tell you what it was. Okay. There were, in there in Korea, signs that said we were rapists. And all the women, they hid from us, the American troops. They hid all the girls because they thought we were going to come in and rape all these girls. Can you believe that? But this was the hate, to do, you know, that was part of war, whatever you want to call it. Of course, we didn't. And then when they found out how we were, my God, I had two or three Korean girlfriends while I was over there, young boy. Wait, you want to hear the best, one of the best stories? I'm a sergeant, and I got an MP there, one part. They put me in charge of a geisha house to keep the guys out. This is true. <laughs> well... I didn't keep anybody out. I, all my buddies, I'll, shit, I'll let them in. But I do remember the, met, the, the police coming by one night. <laughs> I can remember this. In every, they didn't have toilets like we have over here. But there was a thing you sat on, and it was like a well. It was full of excretion. And it was just straw, like a house, you know? And I remember this one kid, the police were coming and he ran out the back door and he ran through the damn wall of this thing and ran right and dropped into shit about four foot deep. <laughs> he was begging him to arrest him to come get him out. But I remember that. And I remember how the Koreans ate. And they cooked and because it was the food. They didn't have it then. But towards the, first, the end of the first year, things got better. They started getting farming again and the crops were coming in and the people. And I made friends with some of them, and I can remember that, meeting them and all, and trying to learn the language a little bit. But they were sweet, beautiful people. And you know, I've been around the world now four or five times. I, I met the Zulu king last year, and I bought for our Zulu parade there, bought warriors. I'm trying to bring the Zulu king, a real one, seven sub million subjects for Mardi Gras this year. Folks, they call me Mr. Mardi Gras because I produce about 80% of what you all know is Mardi Gras in the world. And, and I've been a world traveler. And I just came back from the Barrier Reef, Australia, Tasmania, Tahiti, uh, Tibet. China. I've got to do things all over. And the one thing I find it, throughout the world, everybody's really just about the same and wanting the same things. And uh, that's the pathetic thing about this business that's going on in Iraq now and all. Really, we just, we're all the same, basically, you know? We want something for our family better. Uh, and, and, you know, if you, if you practice really all the great religions of the world, it, they're all based on love. If you just had that, you wouldn't have... Uh, and I, maybe I'm, I am a perennial optimist. I hope to see some more of this before I die anyway. I really do. 
and meeting these people. And oh, they all want to come. Hey, we're out this little town that we're in, New Orleans. We are unique in the world. When I met the Zulu king, the first thing you want to know, well, how's things in New Orleans after the great storm? Katrina here, you know? Man, and then everywhere I travel, the Tahiti, everywhere. How's New Orleans? And you know, we don't have, we don't have a million people, a half million people. Right. But, you know, in, in talking about the world, I'm talking about Paris and London and Tokyo, all the great cities in the world, New Orleans is known as one of the best party towns on planet Earth. Everybody wants to come here, and why? Because we eat the best food, we know how to party better than anybody else, we really do. And, and the people are, are, are so gregarious and friendly here, that makes the big difference. Makes it very unique. Yeah, yeah, it does, yeah. And you were with the 6th Infantry Division, right? 6th Infantry, yeah. Huh? Okay. And 20th Battalion? Yes, 20th Battalion, yes. 20th Battalion. So describe um, Korea when you, once you landed. Was it still wrecked with damage? And, um, no, no, uh-uh, no, no. We went to a silk factory. It was enormous. I'd never been, being in this from this New Orleans, there was a couple of mills here and all, but nothing. This was a vast thing. And I remember being so impressed with the size of this factory and the sophistication of the equipment that I saw in there. And I thought to myself, golly, these people are advanced, you know? And uh, this was in, in Seoul when I went through there. We used to visit a, a city called Quanju, and that was, and, but um, when I've, I've never been back to Seoul itself though, not Seoul, but rather to Yosu, it's further south. But I, I'm gonna go back, I'd like to go back after, my God, it's 60 years ago or something like that, it's over 60 years ago that I was there and, and see it, I know I wouldn't even know it anymore, but it was a beautiful town. It had a, like, because the, the harbor was filled with these oriental junks, you know, and you'd see these people fishing, and you watched in the evening. They called it the land of the morning calm, and in the morning, you'd watch the sun come up in the evening, and you'd see these fishing boats with the sails would turn russet red, and it was gorgeous, it really was. And the people themselves were absolutely friendly, and it was something, nobody, the orientals don't know what a chair is, you know. They squat, did you know that? They don't have chairs like this, they just don't. Now they do now, it's because we've westernized them. I don't know if we've done too good at that, i tell you the fact. But anyway, but they would squat, and then the, the, the old gentlemen, the old people in particular, every one of them had a pipe this long, or that long. And then they'd put the little tobacco in it, and you'd see them smoking it. And the hat was a funny hat, it looked like a, a formal hat that you'd have, only thing was a little more shaped like a, you'd think a witch's hat would be. Not a witch, because witch, but it, like a, a, a Quaker hat, somewhat. But it was open with a piece in the front, and then they all had a beard and a mustache, and, and then they had, the, the clothing was so different than ours, and they all wore, 99% of them had like uh, 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 slippers on, but made of, of reed or something that they, put together and wore that type of, they didn't have any leather shoes, very little bit. And um, the women wore, wore the kimonos and everything, it was very, because remember this is, by God, back in the 40s, this, you know, this is the way it was. Uh, but I do remember them being a very warm and f friendly people, and I got to know some of them, and I actually, there was a young boy that lived with us, a couple of kids were, worked in a mess hall, you know, and we took a like, and I just wondered whatever happened to them in their lives, really. Going back, touching up yeah. on Korea. Yeah. I'd heard from other people um, that the Japanese were saying that we were the rapists. Yeah. I think before they left and and and, and you know were captured or evacuated. Yeah. They were poisoning the people like they did. Oh, they did. Yeah, 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 yeah. We were gonna kill and yeah, 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 people. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it, it was just some misinformation. To, to oh, completely, us, completely. But you know what? Uh, I traveled uh, after the war. I've been an entrepreneur. And I went into to uh, Prague, in in Czechoslovakia, and Prague is the center of the glass industry, and for a thousand years the best crystal and all comes, it, it, how do you say it, Swarovski or whatever, Swarovski, whatever it is, the the, the, the rhinestones and all. But anyway, it's, the, that's the center of the glass industry, and prior to us 
putting down factories in China, making the plastic beads. Everything came from Czechoslovakia, where they thrown from the floats the beads. So I went over to buy there, but I remember going there, and in the old days I was a dude, I'd have not only the, the French cuffs, but lace shirts and all kind of stuff, and, and I went up in there, and I remember going in, I was the only American in the only hotel that was open, it was communist, you know? And it, what the communists did, every part of their economy, they would put one city would do all the rubber products, another city would do all of the steel products, another city would do all, I know each city had a specialty. So the glass industry was in a city called New Goblins, and I was gonna go there. But when I went there, they had timbers on churches. The communists were atheists, they didn't have let you go to a church, anything. And they had billboards showing like a silhouette of an American soldier hovering over a girl with a blouse half tore. But you knew it was an American soldier by the silhouette hovering, implying that we were rapists. And then they had other pictures, supposedly, of contemporary America, which was taken from 1932, when we were selling apples on a corner in the great height of the Great Depression. But in 1950s, 30, 20 years, 30 years later, they were depicting that still going on in the United States. And I said, and anyway, I had the first land, Polaroid land camera. The first year it came out. And man, when I went over there, that was revolutionary in, in America. You got a picture instantly. I went over and I was, took people's pictures. And man, they wanted to see how I did that so fast. And you were not allowed to travel, or rather to, to congregate more than three or four people. This is the way the Russians had, the way that they, they handled the, the, this country. So I'm taking a picture, but all of a sudden I got about 15 or 20 people looking at the camera and talking to me, and I'm dressed like a dude. They're in babushkas. They look like down. They look like they're 19, 30, or 20, and I'm looking like a dude. Follow? So I said, wait, do you, do you believe? That you can't go to church here if you want to. I said, but do you believe these billboards? I said, that's bullshit. That's not America today. I said, I'm a, I'm a poor boy who's making plenty of money now, but oh, in America you could do it. I said, don't believe these billboards. I said, but more importantly, I'm visiting you. Could you visit me? And it was like a bullet between us. And just then, two Russian soldiers come down the street. I said, oh, Christ, Curran, you're going to Siberia. So I took my camera, and I shoved it in their faces. I said, I said comrade, Rushki. And I slapped them on the side. I said, American, take your picture, take your picture. Night, night, they want me to take their picture. I put them on a the defense. The people ran. Jesus Christ, I said, oh, God Almighty. He said, night, night, night. They let me go. I go back to the hotel, and I'm about back to the hotel maybe two or three hours later. When I walk in, the guy behind the counter says to me, Mr. Kern, what you did today could have grave consequences. I said, wait, what did I do today? Mr. Kern, what you did today could have grave consequences. What did I do wrong today? What are you talking about? Mr. Kern, what you did today could have grave consequences. Three times he told me. Now he had a billboard behind him too saying about American imperialists and bullshit. I said, do you believe all this shit? I said, hey, I'm over here, pal. Anyway, in those days, that's when the China and Russia were still close friends right after the war. We thought they were gonna become allies, remember? Yes. The whole hotel is full of Chinese colonels and generals. I mean, and I go into this damn ballroom in there and I go in there all dressed up and I took on all of them saying about, I was a poor boy, a sign painter's son, and I'm worth probably over a million dollars already, and I'm, my company's gonna grow and grow. And I took them on saying about the American way of life, and edu and I was telling them about, I'm very Catholic, and this and this, and boy, and I was hitting them. I took on all of them, this is a true story. And, and, the, and the secret police followed me for days afterwards. You ever heard of Kim Novak? But, okay. but anyway, she was a movie star, it was from there. She was coming to Czechoslovakia, about, and I was gonna be there. But it was so bad for me. Oh, but I went to sleep at night. That's the center of the glass industry. There's a, in any nice hotel, there's an outer door and an inner door to your room. I put two of these giant ashtrays. I thought I was gonna have to compliments to come in to catch me. I know it sounds melodramatic, but this is true. I was afraid I'd, I'd have to throw something to protect myself. But they followed me everywhere, the police did. And I didn't stay to meet Kim Novak. I was going to be meet a beautiful movie star. I'd be the only American with I, you know? Anyway, that's, I got off this track. I don't know if that was good for the interview or not. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely um, had an interesting time. Oh, Jesus, have I.
I'll tell you something in, in military in, that I was hooked up with that'd be interested in. I have a factory in Valencia, Spain. They say Valencia. And uh, uh, I guess 15 or 20 years ago, yeah, it's about that long ago. Anyway, uh, we were going to, we were starting to do gambling here, remember? Yes. And, and Governor Edward Edwards. Anyway, I find out that they're going to sell this aircraft carrier, which was the Cabot, the John Cabot Lodge, was used. Franklin Roosevelt, right after Pearl Harbor, took seven heavy cruisers and turned them into light carriers because we were decimated almost at Pearl Harbor, remember? Thank God our the carriers weren't. But anyway, and they started, Doolittle was saying, well, you know, air warfare was going to be, and he was right, of course. So he, I got, this Cabot Lodge became, and we were friends with Spain, and after the war was over, oh, incidentally, George Bush's daddy flew off this carrier, and it was hit by kamikazes, wonderful war record, one of the second or third most citations in, in all the war. It, 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 it was it was the Cabot, USS Cabot. We gave it to Spain, and they named it the Dedalo. The Dedalo was the son of Icarus. Icarus was the Greek that put feathers on and wax and flew too close to the sun. And his son and he, when the the, the wax melted, his wings fell down. So the Dedalo became the flagship of the Armada. They still call their their. Navy, to this day, the Amada. Wait, the story gets better. I go over there, and who do you think I meet? Now, I meet a young man named Christopher Columbus, the direct descendant of the original Columbus, and he wears a gold medallion around his neck that declares him to be the Admiral of the Ocean Seas, given by Isabella to his great-great-great-granddaddy. Now, I meet him, and I start bullshitting and talking with him. Then I bring the Admiral out, and as a thing called the Fieros, that's from the 11th century, they, on St. Joseph Day, over there, it's very Catholic in Spain, they burn all these magnificent Fabi glass and paper mache figures. And I got a factory there, you follow? Yes. For 50 years now. I remember that he told me when he was on that march, if you straggled too long or something, they would take you and bayonet you right then and there, or the guys would die of starvation. There was no food and water. Mm -hmm. And and he told me, you can't believe marching for days like that. And it was just like, it was got to be, and he was a little wiry man, so he was strong. Mm -hmm. But uh, the cruelty to him, towards him, like, uh, you know, you couldn't believe it. And it, these were, they were absolutely barbaric, honest to God. The Bataan, right? Or yes, on, in, on Bataan. He told me that that march, and he'll always remember that. He still would sleep and remember that and wake up. Oh, he told me a story that was interesting. He says, Blaine, we were in line and we were getting food after the war. We'd won the war. And the Japanese were still hiding in the hills, some of them. And the commander of the base came into town and he had a raincoat on and all. And the guys recognized him. And he was getting food. He was in a line to get food, and they recognized him because he was hungry. You follow? They killed that son of a bitch on the spot. They were stomping him and everything else. That was a hell of a story. They recognized him, and they seen him, and, boy, they all attacked him. They really did. Good. Now, you know what? I said, well, how did you feel? He says, we felt wonderful doing it. You know, think about it. Think about you come out of jail. Not a jail. Out of a, a, a hell for five years. And then you know, here's the son of a bitch who's going to come eat your food, and, and he's still alive and fat and well. <laughs> Nothing, they didn't, nobody did him shit anything about it. So you were, um, you've been all over, it seems like. You were you sent to Korea, to Philippines, yeah, yeah, on yeah. a ship. All the whole thing. You went to, you passed by Aleutians. Yeah, 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 yeah. How long did you stay in service? I think it was a little less than two years. Okay. That's all. Because the army was, you know, get, getting rid of people. And I remember coming back, uh, I went to camp, uh, well, what to his name of it? it? was in Monterey, California. It was so pretty there. I forget the name of that camp out in Monterey. But I remember that Ernest, I mean, was Steinbeck wrote Cannery Road. From, from out there, and 
and but anyhow, uh, I came. Oh, I, oh, I do remember coming. Oh, gee whiz, this is about forty-seven, I guess. And I came to San Francisco. I remember that. And from San Francisco, uh, we went to was the top of the Mark Hotel. And I had some dollars with me because I was remember I told you I made plenty of money. And I went to the top of the mark, and a guy named Carmen Cavallaro, that he was a famous pianist back in those days. He was playing. I remember going up in this place, and after having living like I lived, it was like I was back in heaven again. I couldn't believe myself. And but I remember uh, seeing it, and then wanting to get home so bad. And it was winter. I remember that. But I came back, of course, and I got as far as. The train was only going to go for St. Louis and kept on going, and I had to get home from St. Louis to New Orleans, and so I hitchhiked, I remember that, just to get home. And I remember going home and finally getting back to, to New Orleans, and it was about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, going on Slidell Street, walking up the alley and knocking on side. I said, hey, Mom, Mom, Dad. And boy, I heard my daddy yelling, He's home, Fina, he's home. And I heard the thumping through. We lived in a shotgun house, thumping through, going to the front porch, and I remember the night clothes hugging me, and I was so glad to be back, uh, back to Algiers, you know. But, uh, but I would never give up what I did in the service for anything in the world. It, it, even though I didn't like being a soldier, it taught me discipline, it taught me respect. I think that every kid in America and every kid on planet Earth ought to be forced to go into the military for two to four years. Positively, and learn education, get true, but be learned to respect, because you know, the kids today don't have that. In other words, and that's so essential, my God almighty. I think it's critical, critical. That's, uh, that's the response I get from a lot of veterans. Oh, not a lot, everyone that you know, well sure. It makes you a better person, no question about it. And we all, when you know, when we're 18 years old, 20 years old, we think we think, for God's sake. <laughs> no, <it's not> me. <laughs> um, in your opinion, how did World War II change America? Well, America became the dominant force in the world, naturally. England had been. And um, I'll always remember that we took, in General Marshall, did the Marshall Plan. And I saw Antwerp, uh, Dresden, Berlin. I saw all these people. I went over there, the war was over just a few years when I was traveling to Europe. And parts of it, some of it, was still in ruins in some parts, but 90% of it had been rebuilt. I'm talking about cities of three, four, five millions of people, which was a lot of pe people for those days, 50, 60 years ago. And the Marshall Plan did that. Now, that was the United States Army doing it. Well, and, and you know, I often think to myself, we rebuilt Europe within five years, maybe 10 on the outside. I don't know why we can't be rebuild one city here 50 or 60 years later, if they could do that with an effort. Of course, maybe the Army, maybe the Army should have taken over due to here and not even let civilians, I don't know. I, I, I think the Army would have done it faster and better. And it, it had been, I, I really believe that. All I know is that I felt that, well, if the Marshall Plan could do that to the entire Europe, that we ought to be able to do that for, for, for New Orleans today, positively. But uh, th talking about America, uh, I thought, I think at one point we were a good influence. And then I think about the last 15 or 20 years, partly we have not been a good influence. I think the mu music, particularly the rap music, the, the, the lyrics, the vulgarity, the suggestions, uh, as, you know, everybody wants to imitate Americans. They really do, and it's it's flattery, you know, to be it's it's flattering to be imitated, and yet, the uh, the way we live, uh, 
I think particularly the lyrics, I can't blame these people who are deeply religious, don't want anything to do with that coming, and it, it's corrupting, it really is. And, and, and uh, but I do believe this also, that we're the biggest hearted people, and no matter what they talk about the president, who incidentally happened to be a Republican, I like the guy. I think what he's trying to do is historic. People say, oh, he wanted oil, bullshit. What he was trying to do was do in there for the first time, sure, they wanted security. But, man, I'm, I'm, I'm a visionary. I'm building a city that's going to be a billion-dollar city in Algiers Point. And wait, wait, forget this. In 15 years, oil's going to be unimportant. It's going to grease your machinery. You're going to have exotic fuels. You're going to be using solar energy. You're going to be using things from the earth, from you know, the heat. To, the, the, all this, you're going to have airplanes, rocket planes, going to Tokyo in an hour from here. And that why I think New Orleans is going to rise like the phoenix from the water is that everybody knows the name New Orleans. Everybody, what do you want to do on a vacation? You want to drink, eat good food, and party and relax. we got the best reputation might be on planet Earth. So we're definitely going to be growing all this time. So what I'm saying, all this is happening to, to our wonderful city. Oh, hell. I forget where I was going with it all. <laughs> so, no, but... but uh, that's going to happen. He, oh, going back to our president. He is trying to establish a republic in virtually, we call it, if you're religious, the Garden of Eden in the Euphrates Valley, the cradle of mankind that's never had a republic. They've established a constitution. The people there are so different than us. I mean, they're violent and all that. But they're trying to put it together. Maybe it won't end up. Maybe it'll be three or four different countries. But at least I believe that if this could happen, if he could pull this off, he will go down as one of the greatest presidents in American history. One of the very greatest. It's it, bigger than life what he's envisioning. And now the media, which is so damn liberal, they don't like him worth a damn. They really don't. And, man, they knock him and pan him in every which way, make him look like he's not a boob, he's not a... a, 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 a I'll tell you, uh, I, I, I just, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, I, can't, I don't like any of the... I'm very much a Republican, you know that much. But anyway, um, I think that he will go down. I just hope that we can pull this off. If we don't pull it off, if we don't pull it off, we're in more trouble, I promise you. Because, they not only is there going to be a hotbed of a country that's against us, and, you know, all these other countries, while they don't want it, think of this. Where in the world, other than in these countries that hate us so badly, there's a few of them that have women presidents. But for the most part, a woman there has no shot. God, did you see this poor woman in, I think it was in... Um, uh, Addis Ababa or somewhere, something in Africa. She named a teddy bear. Yes, and my God, uh, you know, but then that's bad enough. But just think that a, they can't, A, they don't, they have to wear a veil, for Christ's sakes. They can't vote. They have nothing to say. They're second-class citizens. That's, uh, that's my God, it's medieval. And therefore, they, and wait, if this group that takes over they're so strong into that, they would like to they would like to convert all of us into the same thing. Because they really and truly think we're infidels. And I think what their religion is basically all about is beautiful like ours is. It all preaches love. It really does. And not certainly killing each other over, you know, the, the, the name of a religion more or less. Just radical interpretations. Yes. Uh, yeah, positively. Mm, that'd be good. And... What are, what are some of the positives and negatives that the war had for the United States as you see it? Well, I think that uh, as we got bigger and stronger, uh, it's like you got a rich cousin. You like him and everything, but you're a little resentful of him. You said, that son of a gun could buy a car. I can't buy that kind of car. Look at the house he lives in. And he belongs to a club. Man, and look what he gives his kids. That's natural. I want that for my kids. I want that for me. But so therefore, the resentment is natural. I really believe it's that. But when you visit these countries, I've been going into China. When I'd go into China, 
I'd be the only American, only white person some of them ever seen. They come run at you and flock at you and hug you and want to meet you and talk to you. Honestly, it was that way. I was in Shanghai when they had one hotel that Hilton was, wasn't even finished being built. And I was, I've been traveling in countries like that. I've been in Tibet. What do you think of Tibetan ask you when you first meet him? He says, well, what song do you bring me from your country? <laughs> it's true. Me, I said, hey, when the saints go watching. <laughs> and they start singing a bridge baritone voice, two or three of them, something I don't know, but it's beautiful. It makes me sound like crap, of course. <laughs> but anyway, but everywhere I go in my life, in Africa, in, in I just came from Tasmania, seeing the Tasmanian devil and all that nonsensical stuff. People love Americans. They all love us. Even They love us. They're resentful, but yet they... They see us as being able to do anything. You know, and that's why everybody wants to go there. And they really do. And come here, rather, I should say. Thank you. Yeah. And what is the significance of having this, this National War II Museum? Oh, God. So critical. So, you know, and the kids today, they don't have educations. My God, you can't forget this. Man, I remember so many guys. Man, I remember Godfrey oh, McNeely. He was the light heavyweight champion of New Orleans. And I remember him coming in my yard and digging me. I couldn't do it as a little boy. Digging me a hole for my turtle in my backyard. And I remember Godfrey went on board a ship. He was a merchant marine, merchant seaman, and off of Africa. I think he was torpedoed and he was killed. And Jody Delsage. Joe Delsage was an artist and a sign painter helping my daddy. And Joe Delsage, man, was in Tarara, Guadalcanal, and he died about a year or two later of wounds that he suffered. He was in a wheelchair when he came home. But I remember these guys. And uh, Delcazel, we named a little park for him. But I remember, I knew all these guys were dying. And they went and gave them, and I mean the cream of, of, of everybody. And that was the, I remember a band, a guy named Lou Ayers. And Lou Ayers was Dr. Kildare. Big, big TV, rather, big, big movie star. And he was a conscientious objector. And he didn't want to go to war. Then they drummed him out of the motion pictures. They didn't want him anywhere around. People, they were, we were patriotic, man. I, all I'm trying to say is, is that it changed America. It made us internationalist. We saw the, and then, oh, heck. Good. Uh, what else? I don't remember. Uh, you're talking about how all your uh, these people you oh, were sacrificing yeah. so much. Oh, yeah, they, they, everybody. And I remember we, we saved paper, we saved metal, the, the drives. I remember selling war bonds. I remember the movie stars coming into Wallens. Everybody was in the darn thing. And, and then I remember, boy, at Higgins, the landing craft here, and what was going on, God. We did our share down here, in, in, and I remember go, I was a fisherman, and I remember this going out to the feet and going down to the mouth of the river and every night, every night you'd see the orange in the sky where a ship had been blown up and sunk by a torpedo with the German subs. But I remember seeing that. Then I remember being finding there was bread and fuel and food in some camp down, somebody was a sympathizer and had you know, the Germans were actually coming ashore in Lafitte, down that way or down in near the shoreline down there to get supplies fresh. And they, somebody was cooperating with him, obviously. And, and, but I remember that. And then I think we sunk one, uh, one or two uh, submarines all the time. I do know there was one sunk, definitely. Right. Yeah. And they just found one like a few years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah so. that's true, yeah. Um, um, so you think the museum... It's going to have, have a major impact. Oh, God, this museum is beautiful, sure, positively. And um, it, it, what it does is it, it reminds us of what we were called, not that we think we are, but the greatest generation, because there was a sacrifice. And I forget how many million boys did die in that war and everything. Uh, but then that was the, the last war we fought that wasn't really political. Ever since then, with this... When there was Korean War started, that got to be politics. When Truman wouldn't let MacArthur bomb him, 
we could have ended up communism right then and there. Because when I went to China, Chiang Kai-shek was still in power, you know. And and then, of course, it was popular, the communists. Everybody thought they were going to own everything. And that turned out to be not so good. And while they're communists, atheists and everything, hell, they have, a, they have an economy. Listen, I'll go over there. They are corrupt in their country environmentally like you don't believe. They've, they've harnessed the Yangtze River. I forget this biggest dam in the world. But then it, that has had a consequence with the environment like you don't believe. In Beijing, the desert's approaching. They're planting trees in front of it to stop it, and they can't. In other words, and I saw them breaking big rocks with big sledgehammers, then smaller rocks with smaller sledgehammers, and then little tiny rocks with little thousands of people working building highways before they had equipment. I watched all that, being in China all those years, you know? And uh, there's a singular purpose over there. It really is good. But the biggest thing they got going yet is the love of family. They do have that yet. And even and that even transcends religion and everything, respect. And that's what I fell in love with the Orients for that. I fell in love with the Chinese and the Koreans when I was, my God, 18-year-old boy, fell in love with them. Um, tell me more about the Stars and Stripes. You say you, you, wrote, you did illustrations for them? Yeah, well I, well, I did some cartoons and sent it, and they used them, yes. Uh -huh. how, how many do you remember? Oh, half a dozen or so. Okay. And, and I got some drawings of it. I can find the damn things. Yeah, I did. I brought a couple of drawings that I did from, uh, uh, you know, of tanks, and, and it's a vintage. Oh, yeah. And then I, I, I did a, I've got a drawing here. Do you want to take a picture of this, or how do you do it? Uh, oh, I could just, you guys could, um... I could open it up, uh, because, uh, w this wouldn't be on a film, would it? No, huh? It'd kind of be... Yeah, yeah. But I mean, then I got a picture here of a... Uh, well, hell, let's see. This looks like this. Yeah. Okay. God, it's faded a little bit. But this cartoon was... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I can't see it now. Let me get familiar. Oh, good shot. Yeah. This is me. And Dunbar, oh golly, I can't see it anymore. Me and Dunbar and, all, and, and Leo Burley. I, I got to meet Leo later, maybe 50 years later. He lives in Boston. And I've lost track with most of the guys, but these are the guys that are all with drinking beer. And uh, this was in Yosu, South Korea, 1946, I guess it was. Wow. And... Um, but I remember, I remember these guys. One guy was, we call him a Pachuco from L.A., you know? And, uh, and then another one was Cook, who was from Skokie, Illinois. I'll always remember that, south of Chicago. And there was Braley. But, but these are the, you remember these people the rest of your life. And you form, I think, like I said, about everybody going to the Army, everybody. Uh, you form friendships with unique people. You become in contact, and you, you realize and you understand different... Other way, other parts of the world and the cities, how different they are than you, but yet you end up respected and liking each other, and it broadens you tremendously. It really does. Especially as a young man. Oh, as a young man, it's critical. It really does. Were you able to get it, more yes, or less? Sir. I got it. On. Okay, and then this here is archaic. This, of course, is from, uh, oh my God. Well, I'm 80 years old. Mm. 80 years old, and I did this when I was, oh, my God, 13. And look at the tanks. Little <laughs> World War I vintage, you follow? Because remember, I'm drawing this back in 19, I guess, 30, um, 1930, oh, God, six. I was 30, yeah, because I'm born in 27, 37. This is maybe 1939, 1940, I was drawing this in, in um, the tanks. But no, I, I won every contest in, as far as artwork. That, that cartoon doesn't show anything I can do, believe me. But nevertheless, uh, this, this was, uh, my, and my dad was an artist. My mother, everybody were all talented, really, in the family. And, uh, 
Anyhow, I remember doing, and, and, uh, and I'm, I've also been a good talker. <laughs> good salesman. A good salesman. Probably one of the best salesmen I know. <laughs> for, um, yeah. Besides the Stars and Stripes, did you do illustrations for other magazines during the war time? No, but, but I painted murals okay. all over. I painted murals in, in Kwon Yu, in Yosu, and, um, and then, like I said, we, we did signs and, you know, all sorts of things because in English all over because, you know, it was, it was, we were first troops up in there and all. Where to go, directional things and that kind of stuff. A sign that showed up in the Korean War. Yes, yeah, the one sign. That's, I was real proud of that. Say, hey, my sign is still up. <laughs> I wonder what happened to the sign. Oh, who knows? By God, you know. The best damn port in the Pacific. Jesus God. Um, yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to add about your wartime experiences or post right after the war? Well, oh yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I painted when I came home. I think I, I may have told you I painted this mural to pay for my mom's doctor bill. I tell you this, okay. and um, mother was sick, and this was this guy La Rocca. Oh, I didn't get into no more of it exactly. Uh, and he liked my work, and he said, "Well, son, can you design and paint a parade?" Well. Hell yeah, I could do anything when I was 20 years old. Daddy guaranteed the job. I thought I'd done it on my own for 30 years. One reason I got it, my father guaranteed it would be finished. Anyway, but this other man I mentioned before, Darwin Fenner, his grandpa started, I mean, his daddy started Maryland Pierce Fenner and Bean, the biggest stock brokerage firm. And he sent me to Europe, which, which broadened me out. But I built a gorilla that walked his head turned from side to side, he snarled, his mouth opened and closed, he carried a girl, and a guy named Walt Disney came to town and saw my work. And I'm going to work for Disney, man. And Darwin Fenner says, son, let me tell you, you're good, you're gonna go out to Hollywood, you're gonna be a big fish in a big pond. You stay here in New Orleans, Mardi Gras is opening up to everybody, and he was right. Mardi Gras was a $200,000 year industry when I started. And it was only, you couldn't be black, you couldn't be Italian or Jewish to join any of these crews. It was strictly anything but democracy. Well, it still isn't democracy because these captains are the, ben the benevolent despots, the power upon the throne. If, if you don't like what happens in those crews, they say, don't let the door hit you on the ass on the way out. But anyway, Fenner says to me, son, you go to Hollywood, you're gonna be a big fish in a big pond. Stay in New Orleans, you'll be a big fish in a little pond. Well, believe this or not, I stayed in New Orleans, he was right, but I had the best of both worlds. I got to know Walt. I am doing Mickey and Minnie and Goofy. I'm the only one allowed to do this in a, the world and still doing that work today for the Disney Corporation. So I had, I had the, the best of both worlds.